Okay, first case, stable beam writing. Take one. Well, it didn't work again, did it? <laughs> Anna. <laughs> What? Uh, yeah, slideshow. It's this. I'm not using the PC version. Um, yeah, yeah. And do what? What happens? Uh, okay. There is the stable beam writing. Oh, the, the beam is oscillating, and the be and the sail is following it. Okay. Okay. Next. Next slide. Unstable beam riding, it's not shaped correctly. You notice it's much shallower beam, a uh, much shallower sail, and it hangs around and hangs around until it falls off. And it's quick. Bang. <laughs> Last scene falling off. Okay, now moving right along to the spinning sail apparatus. As before, the beam comes from below. This cockamamie couple of sails, one of them's a carbon-carbon microtrust sail in the shape of a propeller. This was halfway of a, of a joke of a design, frankly. And a, 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 an aluminum, aluminum foil, thin aluminum foil sail with a, a, a kind of looks like a Klingon warship. Hmm? Oh, absolutely. You can't, it doesn't work without circular, circular polarization. So we tried it with a linear polarization to show it doesn't spin then. We tried it with positive circular. It sp spun in that direction. We tried it with negative sp circular and spun the other way around. Now, there's a trick in this movie, a, a trick of the eye. It will look at times as if the, the sail suddenly starts to rotate the other way without hesitating. It doesn't. It's an optical illusion like in, those, in the movies when you see those wheels and cars going backward. Because what we're doing here is we're raising the power steadily. You'll hear my voice saying the power level in watts, 300, 400, 500, and you'll see it spin faster and faster and faster. We keep going up, and you'll hear Greg commenting upon the performance in the background. You'll hear Olga talking about the settings on the apparatus which she was c uh, controlling. So... Uh, it, this is real-time laboratory experiment. Let's see if this one works. And here we go. It's got 300. What's going on? Okay, here's 350. Okay. 350. Okay. Uh, here's 400. Yeah, but it's going back. Here is 500. Now that's finished. Yeah, now that's good. All right. Here is 600. There's the optical illusion. Okay, there's a later film for those of you who are purists and want to see the, how it goes from there on up to 900. It just gets faster. Uh, uh, but there it is. Those are the movies, and thanks very much. <laughs> That's right. You could have microwave-driven light bulbs that screw themselves in. Right. Uh, I'll, you, can take, you can have the patent. It's yours. Uh, Greg, you want to introduce Paul Davies? Yes. Uh, I have a couple of uh, small announcements. Is Mike Mongo here? Yes, right here. Oh, here he is. Suddenly, yeah, sir. Here's your, here's your Mike wants to you. say something for a moment or two, and then I'm going to follow with some business, and then we'll get on. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Greg. Hello. 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 How's everyone today? <laughs> yes. 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 So my name is Mike Mongo. I am. I am. A, I introduce myself to kids. I work with a lot of kids. Uh, my name is Mike Mongo. I'm an astronaut teacher, and uh, I'm the author of Mike Mongo's Astronaut Instruction Manual for Preteens. Ta-da! <laughs> and uh, I'm also. I work with Icarus Interstellar, and Icarus Interstellar is putting on Starship Congress in uh, August, and we have a division at Icarus Interstellar called Farmaker, and it's and we got the name for, based on uh, Olaf Stapleton's Star Maker. That was where we t we had derived that from. And our idea at Farmaker is that we have the opportunity to encourage the, the, the development and, con and creation of content and media, such as video games and, and uh, comic books, where all the good ideas are coming from, by the way, and, uh, and <coughs> excuse me, popular media, and to encourage the creators of these forms to, to foster interest in an in interstellar accomplishment. And so what we do at Farmaker is how we started, our very first thing. Does, it, does anyone have a wristband on in the room that says build a starship? 
Hallelujah, my people, my, my people. What we do is we pass out these wristbands at the different events, and they're, they're denoted. This one says Starship Century 2013, which, by the way, Starship Cent Century is the, my favorite name. I mean, I don't know which one of you guys came up with it. Oh, it was Jim. And uh, so, if you sure that's Jim. So, so I have to read the label. Uh, and we, we pass these out, and, uh, and it's a real simple way to embody all of our work. Now, I don't know, there was a young man here yesterday, his name was Alex, what was, what was his name, Alex? Uh, Williams. Williams. And David Hartwell, yes. So uh, he was here yesterday, and, and Alex Williams, his dad was, was a pretty big guy, and uh, I think he worked, did, worked on some uh, science for uh, propulsion, as I recall. No, he was a rock journalist. Oh, yeah. Oh, his dad was a, a crawdaddy. Sorry. Crawdaddy. That's right. That's right. So that 11-year-old was in here today, yesterday with all these famous scientists and brilliant people. And we have the opportunity, as these famous and brilliant people working on interstellar projects, to walk up to the 11-year-olds and ask the most important question that they may ever hear. And that question is, what are you going to do when you grow up? Because we, as space scientists and researchers and physicists and engineers, they, we have the answer to that question, and chances are that if you ask somebody what they want to be and, and they say, I want to be a rap star, I want to be a rock star, and you say, have you ever thought about being a scientist? Or e even better, have you ever thought about being an astronaut? A lot of times they'll light up. And, and when we sort of, if you didn't say hi to Alex yesterday, you sort of missed an opportunity because Alex was here. So if you've got Alex and, and Freeman Dyson in the same room, I mean, that boy is going to, that young person is going to talk about that for the rest of his life. And blessings to his parents for bringing him here, right? So whenever I'm out and I see a young person, I inevitably stop and ask that question. What are you going to be when you grow up? And that's what, that's what at Farmaker, at Icarus Interstellar, that's one of the, one of the ways that we're connecting and contacting with people. And, and so right now I'm going to charge everyone in this room, uh, uh, Jonathan Post said an awesome thing to me. He said, uh, uh, the secret to success is to, is to surround yourself with people smarter than you. Well, I wear my glasses upside down, so that's really actually very easy. And, 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 but, but he said, surround yourself with people smarter than you and give them a job to do. But I, my spin on that is that surround yourself with people smarter than you and give them something fun to do. And so by going around and encouraging kids to pursue careers in astronautics or space, I mean, there's nothing more fun than that. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate your five minutes. Thank you, Greg. Thank, thank you, Jim. That is an important question to ask. I remember asking it myself when I was a, a young boy, and I decided to, to just not grow up. <laughs> it, was, it was just easier. And it, and it was worked so far. <laughs> Um, a little bit of logistics. Here's how the rest of the day goes. Uh, at 5, they're closing remarks, 5.30, more signing outside. And, and um, something I think we haven't even mentioned here yet, Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore is holding a book signing in, in which all the participants in this are, are welcome. It is uh, a store that's less than 10 kilometers away from here. Um, and uh, it's at 7 p.m. Uh, side remark, there are a number of people who don't have cars and want to get there. I want you, uh, as soon as we break here after five, to meet outside. We'll have, we want to put together the people who have cars and the people who don't, and be sure that everyone's covered. Um, and remember that, otherwise you're not going to get there. Um, now, we actually go on to the program. Paul Davies I met as, in 1976 because I was beginning to work on a novel that came to be called Timescape, and I wanted to um, talk to the guy who'd written the best book I had read about the nature of time. Still an extremely good book about it. Um, one of the, you know, t books about time, in my uh, experience, are, are somehow timeless. <laughs> because it's not as though we're really learning a lot more about time. Ever since Einstein did all the, the, the heavy digging for us, we were mostly just walking around the perimeter and, and thanks to John Kramer's rendition showing that we can do really fantastic things far better than any damn fantasy novel you ever read just by obeying the laws of physics um, or what we think are the laws. Um, so I met Paul Davies. He was at uh, University of Newcastle, I think, at the time. King's College of London. King's College of London. I'm sorry. I'm getting mixed up already. 
Um, King's College London, and we had a very good discussion, and I have seen him through the decades, and he's referred to in Timescape. Um, and uh, now uh, he is, uh, the, the, he was the founding member of the Arizona State University program, uh, which has a name sort of like a, this, the Clark Center, and I can't remember the name of it. The Beyond Center. The Beyond Center, yeah. The Beyond. It, uh, notice, I, I like that indefinite thing, because it doesn't say beyond what. Uh, <laughs> But it, and it's got admirable people in it and uh, lots, has lots of great things. You can't hear me very well? Well, I'm speaking, okay, is that good? I guess I had heard some people think, saying that this mic was cutting out some. So I guess for all speakers, just you know, make love to the microphone. Yeah, right. Uh, so uh, Paul has done a remarkable number of things in theoretical physics. He's written some of the best scientific popular treatments uh, that did not, uh, did not somehow uh, patronize the readers, and they're very popular. Uh, he wrote a very good one about SETI and the mysterious silence, too, just very recently. So, but now he's going to talk about what he wrote uh, for our, our book, Starship Century, about the entire problem of... Uh, alien biospheres and uh, what might lie in store if you try to colonize them. And then the question, of course, is whether perhaps you should. Paul Davies. Thank you, Greg, for that introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I shall move uh, swiftly along because the program's falling a little bit behind. Uh, most of the contributions to the conference so far about the problems of reaching the stars have addressed issues of physics, uh, engineering, and to a certain extent, economics. Uh, well, leaving out the latter, uh, the principles governing the physics and engineering are very well understood. So we know uh, the laws of physics, we know that we're dealing with uh, standard physics, uh, and uh, the, uh, the approach to uh, solving those problems is pretty much laid out. Uh, so, uh, in the uh, what remains of the afternoon, I'm going to uh, turn to the subject of biology. Uh, now, uh, Jill Tata, a few moments ago, said uh, she hoped I was going to elevate the temperature of the meeting and say something controversial. Uh, so, uh, when I try to enrage my biology colleagues, I often say, well, uh, biology is not even a science, you see. Uh, <laughs> what do I mean by that? Uh, uh, physics is a science, indeed uh, chemistry is as well, because it has uh, a theory that is a well-understood theoretical basis, a mathematical basis. So we can make uh, quantitative uh, predictions. Apart from Darwinian evolution, uh, biology has no theoretical basis. So biologists certainly use scientific techniques, that is, techniques from physics and chemistry, uh, for their subject, but there is no theoretical biology. We don't understand biology, still less ecology. Uh, so biology is at the stage of um, uh, what I think Rutherford once derogatorily said was stamp collecting, um, and it's not at all clear uh, that there are any deep underlying principles in biology anyway, that it may just be a very large collection of special cases. So that makes biological problems especially tough to tackle. And so whilst we've been dwelling mainly on the, the physics and engineering, I think when it comes to the biology, uh, that's where our ignorance is, uh, is great. Freeman Dyson mentioned this uh, yesterday, that the real, really tough problems in this whole uh, interstellar travel business are on the biological side. So that's what I, I want to talk about. Now, I don't need to dwell too much on issues like Kepler. We heard about that this morning, um, and the very large number of planets that have been discovered. Just on a historical note, since uh, Greg uh, took me back to those uh, decades past, uh, at that particular time, of course, nobody had uh, discovered any planet outside the solar system. Uh, most astronomers, however, assumed they were there, uh, but there was no direct evidence for it. And there were still a few diehard people, at least in the 60s, uh, prepared to argue that uh, the planets in our solar system were some sort of freak event uh, caused by special circumstances and that there may be no other planets uh, beyond uh, the solar system. Well, we now know that that uh, is not the case. There are uh, plenty of planets out there, so plenty of real estate which is uh, either uh, habitable or potentially habitable. And so that raises an interesting scenario. 
Uh, I call this our trillion year future because whatever uh, the problems we may, uh, may face in the immediate future, uh, if we get through the next century, uh, then I think we're set fair for a very long period of time. So it's interesting, this is called the Starship Century. Martin Rees wrote a book recently called the, uh, Our Final Century. So the question is, can we build the Starship in time uh, before something overtakes us? Uh, but if we get through this, this bottleneck, uh, then uh, not uh, Homo sapiens, but our descendants, and they may not be biological descendants, they could be some sort of machine or cy cyborg or some, some type of entity we haven't even thought about, our descendants anyway, uh, would uh, be set fair uh, to spread out across the galaxy and uh, potentially uh, colonize all of that uh, real estate. Uh, that is to say, if it is uh, habitable. Now, uh, newspapers are uh, fond of giving uh, figures of this sort, uh, billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy. Uh, certainly there's going to be a very large number. Of course, it depends a little bit on your definition of what Earth-like means. And it's very important we have to distinguish uh, Earth-like, habitable, and inhabited. Uh, to say a planet is Earth-like, it's not sufficient for it to be in the so-called Goldilocks zone, that is the zone where there would be liquid water. Uh, there are other uh, factors that are probably really important for life, certainly for any uh, complex form of life. For example, a magnetic field, uh, for which you need plate tectonics. Uh, and also, uh, tectonics are important for recycling uh, the uh, atmosphere and, and other materials. And so. Uh, just uh, putting yourself in the habitable zone is, is not really enough. There's uh, uh, other things too. But nevertheless, it's pretty clear that there are going to be a large number of, as it were, other Earths out there. And then the question arises about uh, whether they're habitable or inhabited. These two words sound very much the same, uh, but it's important to remember that just because a planet is habitable does not mean it is inhabited, even by microbes. A lot of journalists just conflate those two terms. They talk about uh, a planet could host life, as if that means just because, in principle, we could take a species from Earth and put it on that planet, and it would uh, live there. Uh, therefore, there is going to be life on that planet. Uh, it uh, simply doesn't follow. It doesn't follow for a very obvious reason. And it's a reason that's so obvious, it is often overlooked. And so it's as well to spell it out. Uh, the question is. Um, about the origin of life. Now, Charles Darwin uh, gave us a wonderful theory about the origin of species, in which he explained how the complexity of the Earth's biosphere today evolved over billions of years from simple microbes. But he refused to be drawn about how, how life got started in the first place. Uh, fa favorite uh, quote of mine, uh, it's mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. Uh, well, it's interesting that physicists have now explained the origin of matter, uh, but the origin of life is still deeply problematic. Again, thinking back to those early days when I was a student in London and then later a so-called lecturer at King's College in London, um, the uh, prevailing view about the origin of life was set uh, by uh, great uh, figures such as Francis Crick and Jacques Monod, uh, and his uh, quote from Crick, what did he think? Life seems almost a miracle, he wrote in 1973. Uh, so many are the conditions necessary to get it going. And that was the prevailing view. In fact, when I expressed interest as a student in the 60s in looking for life beyond Earth, it was a really exciting subject. I was following SETI and things like that. Uh, people thought this was pretty crazy. I might just as well have professed an interest in looking for fairies. Uh, so... Uh, the, the mood was very much that life on Earth began as a bizarre accident, a chemical freak event which was most unlikely to occur anywhere else in the observable universe. It was just a, a unique freak. Now, the pendulum has swung the other way. So uh, in the 1990s, Christian de Duve, who sadly died uh, about uh, two weeks ago, uh, wrote that life is almost bound to arise wherever conditions are similar to Earth. And he has this wonderful phrase, life is a cosmic imperative. So we go from one end that life is a near miracle to the other uh, where life is a cosmic imperative. Uh, well, you'll all be familiar with uh, Frank Drake's famous equations. 
Uh, this is the equation that uh, is to compute the number of communicating civilizations in the galaxy at this time, and it's got all those factors in there. Um, for those who don't follow SETI, this is not like a physics equation uh, where this is based on some theory. These, this is a catalog of facts, uh, a catalog of numbers. It's really a cat catalog of our ignorance. Now, some of those numbers are actually quite well known, and some are less well known, uh, but that one that I've circled there, F sub L, is the fraction of Earth-like planets on which life emerges. And so that is the subject I've just been talking about. When does a habitable planet become inhabited? And it depends on that fraction. That fraction is close to one, then uh, de Duve is right, that life is almost inevitable given Earth-like conditions. But if that fraction is close to zero, uh, then Crick is, was right, uh, because uh, it could be uh, that only one in a trillion Earth-like planets actually gets to have life. Uh, because the error bars are so large uh, on that number, I don't worry too much about the other error bars. A lot of people dwell on L, the longevity of a communicating civilization. We don't know whether it might be 10 years, 100 years, a million years, but the uncertainty in that number, in my view, is much less than the uncertainty in F sub L. Now, we may never have a blow-by-blow -blow account of how life on Earth got started, because it happened a long time ago, and the traces have been obliterated. But we don't actually need that. All we would like to know is, was it a very likely event or a very unlikely event? So this is the question then, how did life begin? And journalists are fond of saying to me, well, um, what do you believe? How many planets out there do you think are going to have life on them? And I say, why ask me that question? I can only answer it if I knew how life began. If you don't know the process that turned non-life into life, you can't estimate the odds. If you knew what the process was, you could have a go at working out how likely it is to happen on a given planet. But we don't know what the process was. And so we can't put a number to it. So the answer is, we don't know. That doesn't mean it's zero. Uh, it doesn't mean it's inevitable. It means we absolutely do not know. And we're only going to get to know if we can either improve our uh, theoretical understanding of the process or do some key experiments. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, we sort of assume that the uh, pathway from non-life to life was a uh, successive complexification of some sort of chemical mixture. Uh, we, we don't know how many steps. Uh, and again, there could be some quite probable steps but, and some quite improbable steps. Uh, but unless all of those steps are completed, uh, then you don't get to life. So there's a sort of spectrum leading at one end uh, for, for, say, bizarre fluke, uh, where this might be something that has happened only once in a Hubble volume, only once in the something the size of the observable universe. It's easy to imagine a sequence of physical and chemical processes that have only happened once in a Hubble volume. Uh, I can give you an example in question time if it comes up. Um, it's equally possible to imagine uh, that uh, matter and energy can be fast-tracked to the sort of complexity we call life, fast-tracked by some principles of complexity or self-organization that we don't yet know or understand. And I'm prepared to believe there are these principle, principles of self-organization. It's just that uh, I've never seen them. They've not been written down. It's not like we can go to a textbook and look up what those principles are and have a go at computing how likely it is something as complex as life can emerge. Um, so uh, I, I'm open-minded. I, I think that maybe there are fundamental laws uh, and principles which are consistent with the underlying laws of physics uh, but not contained within those laws and that these will be principles of organization and complexity. Uh, and I, we see we're sort of groping towards an understanding of that. We don't have it yet. So uh, it's simply a completely open question. So how do we make progress? Well, if it was a chemical pathway taking uh, a mix of simple inorganic substances to the first living cell, then it makes sense perhaps to ask a chemist, you know, how, how might it be done? Or can you do it again in the lab? Can you cook up life in the lab? Uh, well, of course, this is the very place, the very campus, uh, to be discussing the famous Miller-Urey experiment. I think I first came to UCSD to talk to Stanley Miller many years ago. Uh, and he uh, did the pioneering prebiotic synthesis experiment, uh, which I probably don't need to go into in detail. But the, the whole idea was to recreate the conditions on the early Earth. Turned out the conditions that they used were not quite right, but it doesn't matter. The point is that uh, it was relatively easy 
uh, to create the building blocks of proteins, uh, namely amino acids, uh, in just a few days with this apparatus. And so the feeling was, well, if they just did more of the same, left the experiment to run for a million years or something, then maybe something would crawl out. Uh, but since then, uh, this uh, prebiotic synthesis subject has really, I think, say, it's, it's, I was going to say ground to a halt. That's a bit harsh. Um, it's, it hasn't got very much farther than uh, the Milliuri experiment. So in those decades, uh, it is clear uh, that uh, going from the bottom up doesn't really take you very far. And the problem is that the simplest microbe, even the simplest, is so stupendously complex that the gulf between prebiotic synthesis experiments and the, the simplest stripped-down autonomous organism is just uh, staggering. But there's a, a fundamental philosophical problem that stands in the way of trying to approach the origin of life in this manner, that is, uh, by cooking it up in a, in a chemistry lab or by asking a chemist. And the, the problem is this, that when you talk to biologists, they use a completely different language about their subject matter uh, than physics and chemists. Um, biologists use the language of information. They talk about uh, genetic code. They talk about a genetic database in DNA, about signals uh, between cells and around the body, uh, and by instructions which are translated. And so it's all this whole paraphernalia. The language is in terms of information, informa information management and control. Uh, whereas uh, physicists talk about matter and force and energy. And so if we're trying to explain how you go from physics and chemistry to biology, it's not just a matter of complexity. It's a matter of a huge conceptual shift. Uh, you simply, however much you look at matter, force, and energy, you're not going to get the concept of coded instructions coming out. So we need to somehow join these two universes uh, together in the middle. Now, that's not to say that, that chemistry is not important for understanding the origin of life. What chemistry does, it gives you the substrate of life, the stuff in which the um, informational content of life is instantiated, things like uh, DNA and so on. So, of course, it's part of the story. Um, but what we, we might say is it's the hardware part of the story. Uh, the informational content is what we might call the software. Uh, so Paul Nurse, who's the current uh, president of the Royal Society, wrote a very nice article in Nature a few years ago called Life, Logic, and Information. Uh, and uh, let me just read out a quote from his uh, paper there. Uh, we need to describe the molecular interactions and uh, biochemical transformations that take place in living organisms and then translate these descriptions into the logic circuits that reveal how information is managed. This analysis should not be confined to the flow of information from gene to protein, but should also be applied to all functions operating in cells and organisms. In other words, that the real problem of life is a problem of information management, information flow, and organization. And the, the, it's my hope that the underlying complexity of biology uh, can be uh, submerged into a description which takes a modular approach to the logic circuit, so that all that we really need to understand how organisms tick is to understand the, uh, the network of information flow and uh, logical operations taking place, a little bit like an, an electronic circuit. Uh, so we have the hardware aspects and we have the software aspects. If we're interested in the software side or the information side, rather than asking a chemist, we perhaps should ask a computer scientist. So this is John von Neumann, who famously considered the subject of self-replicating uh, machines or automata uh, many years ago uh, and asked the question, is it possible to build a machine that could construct any physical uh, system, including itself? Uh, and so we have here the notion of uh, a, a programmable uh, system or machine uh, which can execute the instructions and build something uh, including a copy of itself, including the instructions that go with it. And it would be interesting to know what people here feel about 3D printers, because if you had a 3D printer that had a tape, a punch tape for its instructions, uh, then you could imagine a 3D printer making another 3D printer with the punch tape as well. So that the difficulty is you've got to make the instructions. Uh, and and the, the DNA, you see, serves two functions. It can be read out as a set of instructions, but it can be replicated just as a physical structure. 
and the cell has to know which of the two operations uh, needs to take place. Uh, and that information itself is not on the DNA, it's epigenetic, it's encoded in the global organization of things. It's a whole fascinating uh, subject area that I'm not going to get into for, for lack of time. Um, but uh, uh, my colleague uh, Sarah Walker and I just got a large uh, research grant to work on uh, the origin of life from this informational point of view. And here's uh, Sarah, she's a NASA astrobiology postdoc at the moment. And we're working on the hypothesis that the transition from non-life to life should be identified with a sort of phase transition uh, in the pattern of information flow, uh, a shift from uh, bottom up to top down. And these are technical terms I don't have time to get into, into but what I want to get across is that the prebiotic chemical synthesis is part of the story. In a way, that's the easy part. Uh, but we're only going to understand what it takes to get life from non-life by understanding this informational aspect as well. And then the, the plan is to put the two together. And so this then uh, brings me on to the whole question about the hazards of interstellar travel and whether we can uh, survive other biospheres and whether we can travel to other biospheres, which hinges on the question that's already come up. You know, are, are we in fact alone uh, in, in the galaxy? Uh, and if we're not alone, we know there's plenty of available real estate. Is it there for the taking? Well, maybe not. We may find that there's already somebody there and that they're not going to take very kindly to us uh, just showing up. Uh, but even if there is uh, no intelligent life, sometimes people say uh, that intelligence is hard, uh, that microbes are easy. Well, um, that may be true. But as I pointed out, the, the error bars on that going from non-life to microbes are much bigger than the error bars going from microbes to intelligence. Uh, so if we can whittle down those error bars, it may be the case uh, that uh, there's lots of um, microbial life and not much intelligent life, or it may be uh, that, that we've got that wrong. Uh, we simply don't know. But in H.G. Uh, Wells' famous War of the Worlds, remember it was the microbes that did in the Martians. They succumbed to terrestrial microbes, and so uh, the question is, is this a hazard? Should we find a habitable planet which has an indigenous biosphere uh, with its own uh, microbial population? So suppose we find a new Earth out there and it's got indigenous life, and let's just keep it simple and assume it's microbial life only. Uh, can we peacefully coexist? Can we just show up on this planet um, pitch our tents and uh, unleash the pigs and plant the potatoes and get on with life, uh, much as it, uh, it, is, it uh, is here on Earth. Uh, and I think uh, the answer depends critically on the nature of that indigenous biosphere. Um, I'm grateful to Chris McKay for this uh, slide. Uh, it uh, depends critically on whether uh, the indigenous life and the new life, life one and life two, if you like, um, are ecologically separate uh, or ecologically integrated or, heaven forbid, biochemically integrated. So if they're ecologically separate, it means they're, in effect, fishing in different pools. They're, they're utilizing different resources and are unlikely to come into direct competition. Uh, we could imagine that uh, the indigenous life likes very high temperatures and we prefer lower temperatures and that, we, uh, that they're... Um, Molecules are the mirror images of ours, and so the stuff they eat and the stuff we eat, you know, are different. And we can imagine some sort of peaceful coexistence. They're e ecologically integrated, even if they are biochemically distinct, and therefore don't deal directly with each other, but can get in each other's way, uh, that there could be a problem about appropriating resources, the raw materials uh, that uh, life needs just think of photons, for example. And so uh, if terrestrial plants need um, uh, leaves to capture uh, the starlight, uh, there's indigenous life with leaves, you know, then there's only enough light to go around. There, there are, it's easy uh, to imagine ways in which you could compete for resources without, being, uh, without one form directly killing the other. Uh, and so... Um, the third possibility is if they're biochemically integrated. In other words, if alien biochemistry and terrestrial biochemistry are sufficiently close that uh, there's going to be um, material exchange between them, and then the two uh, 
biospheres become sort of entangled at the biochemical level, uh, and it's anybody's guess as to what can happen, but it would be very hard to imagine uh, that the two could peacefully coexist uh, for a long period of time. Now, um, how do we know the answer to this? We don't understand any of these things uh, in detail. Uh, and so, um, could we actually do the experiment in advance? Could we get a clue as to whether we could survive an alien biosphere uh, by looking at life here on Earth? And I believe we can. Uh, no planet is more Earth-like than Earth itself. It's the most Earth-like planet we know. Now, if it's the case, as Christian de Duve and many commentators these days seem to believe, that the galaxy is teeming with life, and life does form readily in Earth-like conditions. If that is the case, then surely it should have formed many times right here on Earth. Not just once, but many times. How do we know it didn't? Has anybody actually looked? Now, astonishingly, until a few years ago, almost nobody had thought to ask about whether uh, there has, has been or might still be more than one form of life on Earth. Astrobiologists are very good at thinking of exotic, novel uh, bi biochemistries and life forms on other planets. We go to Europa, what do we look for? Might be something very different uh, from life on Earth. So they're very good at thinking about those things. Scarcely never thought about, well, how do we know uh, that there aren't such uh, so-called alien organisms right here on Earth? And so uh, what I'm talking about, just to be clear, is not just exotic uh, forms of life uh, like uh, life in deep ocean volcanic trenches, so-called extremophiles. These extremophiles are, are the same life as you and me. They're on the same tree of life. They are, so to speak, life one. Same life as us, even those extremophiles. I'm talking about life two, which would have a separate origin and be on a separate tree, not another branch of our tree of life, a separate tree altogether. Separate because it is so biochemically different maybe so metabolically different, that it could not have had a common origin with our own life. So uh, what interests me is the possibility uh, that Earth could have, and maybe still does host more than one form of life. The other life form would have to be microbial only, I think, but that's no problem because the vast majority of species on our own tree of life are, in fact, microbes. Um, and so we can imagine another tree which is microbial only. So I wrote a, a paper some years ago with Charlie Limeweaver, uh, finding a second sample of life on Earth. And following that paper, I held a workshop at the Beyond Center. Uh, it's the full title is the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. And I was astonished that I found about 20 respectable scientists prepared to entertain the possibility uh, that there could be more than one form of life on Earth. So there could literally be aliens under our noses, not necessarily aliens in the sense that they've come from space, though they may have done, doesn't matter where they come from. All we want is a second sample of life. If it is the case uh, that life forms readily, we just need one other sample of life, doesn't matter where it forms, whether it formed out there or down here, as long as we've got one other sample, uh, just one representative, one alien microbe would do it. Uh, and the question is, how do we know they're not all around us? We could imagine alien microbes forming a sort of shadow biosphere which might uh, cover the planet. These microbes would be intermingled with the microbes of life one, the ones we know and love, uh, and uh, we could be blissfully unaware of it because you can't tell by looking what a microbe's made of. Uh, you can't tell what makes it tick without delving into its biochemical innards. And to do that, you require customized technology. Talk to microbiologists, say, have you found any new interesting microbes recently? Well, yes, of course, they're finding them all the time. How do they find them? Well, they have all sorts of um, uh, te tests and uh, procedures which are customized to, to life as we know it. Uh, so if you go looking for A, of course, you'll find A. You won't necessarily find B. Um, and so if there was a form of life, even had a different genetic code, it would actually be really hard uh, to know. So it could be made of the same sort of basic biochemical building blocks, but put together differently, uh, and it would simply fail to respond. You couldn't culture it, probably. You couldn't sequence it. Uh, you wouldn't really know, know it's there. And if you talk to microbiologists and say, do you ever find any funny microbes that won't cooperate with, with your tests and procedures? Well, all the time, yes, of course. What do you do with them? They go down the sink. Uh, you, you, you don't get a PhD uh, by spending three or four years working with microbes that don't cooperate. 
Uh, and so um, we, we simply do not know. Now, it's possible uh, that Earth hosts a shadow biosphere, um, but it's ecologically separate, so uh, these other microbes are occupying niches that are beyond the reach of even the hardiest known extremophiles. So, for uh, just a quick example, the deep ocean volcanic trenches, which host um, li uh, life as we know it, up to a temperature of about 130 degrees, these are the hyperthermophiles, if we found nothing beyond that, uh, say, to 170 degrees, and then suddenly between 170 and 190 were a different lot of microbes, they would stand out in parameter space uh, as being potential alien microbes or life too. Uh, how might it happen that more than one form of life would have ar arisen originally? Well, here's a scenario, the cosmic bombardment, uh, which uh, had the effect in the early days of sterilizing the Earth's surface because uh, these impactors were so enormous, had such a lot of kinetic energy. Some of the biggest impactors would have boiled the oceans dry and swathed the planet with incandescent rock va vapor, sterilizing the whole surface. These same impacts would have propelled vast amounts of material into orbit around the sun, some of which then returned millions of years later. So imagine that life one gets going four billion years ago, wham, surface of the earth is sterilized, but all this stuff is in rocks going around the sun, and then conditions quieten down on earth, and life too gets going uh, under this assumption that is so popular these days that life does form readily. So imagine then life two gets going, and a few million years later, life one comes back. So you've now got two forms of life on Earth. And then by iteration, you can have any number. Uh, and so we don't know that more than one form of life survived to this day, but it seems worth looking. And if we go and find that there is a shadow biosphere, then we've got the answer to this question. Yes, two different forms of life can cohabit peacefully on the same planet, at least at the microbial level. That would be fantastic to know. Would give us just this one microbe from life two would give us uh, two bits of information immediately. It would show that the idea that the universe is teeming with life is justified. It would that F sub L would then come out to be a number fairly close to one, and we can concentrate on the other factors. So that's the first thing that we would know. Second thing is we would know that if we found an alien planet with a microbial in, indigenous microbial biosphere. Uh, the microbes already ensconced on that planet, that it would not necessarily prohibit us setting up shop there as well. So here's the scenario, material ejected into solar orbit and then coming back some millions of years later uh, to give us uh, two forms of life uh, on Earth. Um, but now let's consider scenario two, that we find this uh, real estate out there, but it's barren. So new Earth has no life. That removes the whole obstacle about um, having to cope with this indigenous biology. Uh, is that easier? Well, uh, in some ways it's not. Uh, so there's a certain amount of bad news. One is it came up uh, th this morning in, uh, in the discussion about the role of oxygen. Is it a, an essential uh, si signature of life? Um, we, we don't absolutely know that, but it seems very unlikely that there would be uh, an, an alien planet that would have plate tectonics, which is what you need for the cosmic ray shield, which would have substantial amounts of oxygen of a non-biogenic nature. Seems very unlikely indeed. So chances are you'd find this planet, which might have liquid water, it might be a nice uh, temperature and so on, but won't have a breathable atmosphere. The other thing is that terrestrial uh, ecosystems uh, may not transplant without collapse or a major transformation. We can't expect to just yank them out of their home planet and plonk them onto another planet and expect everything to go well. Now, this is uh, uh, another blast from the past. So Neil's uh, uh, space colonies, cylinders in space. Um, and that seemed a nice idea. This is a transplanted terrestrial ecosystem. Uh, but because it uh, was in the solar system, it would be easy to resupply. But if you're on a starship uh, traveling for thousands of years in a system like this, and you find you've left some vital thing behind, uh, then you just can't go back and get it. So you need to understand in advance uh, the complexity of the biosphere. Um, one of the problems here is that microbiology actually changes in microgravity. I don't have time to go into this in detail, 
but my uh, colleague uh, Cheryl Nickerson at ASU uh, likes to send microbes into space and see how they get on. And uh, the key uh, conclusion here is that in response to microgravity, cells exhibit important biological characteristics that are directly rele relevant to human health and disease, including changes in immune function, uh, stress response, and virulence. In other words, um, microbes in space behave differently from microbes down here. They can even change their gene expression. So even if you uh, work out the fantastic complexity of the web of life, uh, you may find that when you go to different gravity, that this, uh, this changes in response to simply the different gravitational conditions. Now, ecological complexity is staggering. I've said that we don't have a science. There's no science, no sci that biology is not a real science. Ecology is certainly not a real science. We can model things, but has no uh, well-understood theoretical basis. The web of life is, in fact, stupendously complex. And we don't know uh, what is interdependent with what. Uh, the, the real problem is, what we'd like to know is, we're not going to take everything, OK? You're going to take a starship, people go, Pigs, potatoes, mention those, you know, cats and dogs perhaps as pets, um, but then, you know, they've got to eat stuff, and very soon uh, the pyramid spreads out, uh, but it spreads particularly grotesquely once you come to the microbial biosphere. Uh, the, we don't notice the microbes in daily life, but they're everywhere, and they're, uh, the, the vast amount of life, vast majority of life on Earth is microbial, and so this web of life in the soil, uh, in, in the air, uh, on the surface of the earth, beneath the surface of the earth, it's all interconnected, uh, and it's stupendously complex. And what we just don't know among these millions and millions and millions of different species, all at different abundances, is what is the minimal subset which could be extracted and be a fully self-sustaining uh, sub-ecosystem. Just take the human microbiome. Uh, about 10 about 90% of your body's cells are not actually you. They're microbes, uh, bacteria and archaea, in your gut and elsewhere. Uh, they're fulfilling really important functions. But everybody's microbiome is different. So you can't go off to Alpha Centauri and leave your microbiome behind. You've got to take it. And so you've already got a vast number of microbial species just inside you and on your body. But we just don't know how many other microbial species they connect to in this web of life that you also have to take. Now, of course, if you understood this, you could maybe manufacture some on the way. You may get halfway to Alpha Centauri, oh, we've left behind, you know, uh, Deinococcus radiodurans or something. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, you just make it. Uh, but the, the thing is, you have to understand the science well enough to know what to make. Uh, and we simply don't. And don't forget, so here's uh, the tree of life, incidentally. You see the interconnectedness of all things. And it's interesting that humans here, uh, th this little branch of the tree of life, uh, close to the, to the mushrooms and the toadstools and so on. Uh, and you see this, this stuff, the archaea and the bacteria, um, are, are well, uh, genetically, uh, are well out the way. And yet it, it all interconnects. And so we just don't know which bits of it. You can't just, even if you said, well, let's, chop it off here and just take this lot, wouldn't work. And don't forget the viruses. We do tend to forget viruses, which I think they're a menace, but viruses actually play a really important part in ecological stability, in uh, uh, ge genetic um, uh, horizontal uh, gene transfer and other processes. And so you probably need to take the viruses as well. Uh, and you may need to take some nasty viruses as well as nice viruses for the whole system to work. So. The question that I'm, I'm going to leave, I must wrap this up in a few minutes. I've got only four minutes to go. Um, the question I'm going to leave you with is, is, what is this minimal subset of microbial and species diversity that, uh, that you need to take in order to have a self-contained, contained, ecologically stable web, not only in the spaceship itself for the journey, but when you get to this other planet that may have its own special conditions, may even have indigenous life that could impact our life in, in some way that we can't foresee. The one case where this isn't a problem is, uh, is Mars. And the reason it isn't a problem for Mars, this picture says it all, um, Earth and Mars are not quarantined from each other. Uh, they've been trading rocks 
uh, throughout their history, uh, as I'm sure you know, and cocooned inside these rocks, microbes could certainly travel from Earth to Mars and Mars to Earth and uh, arrive viable uh, at the other end. I uh, don't think there's any doubt whatever about this. And so if you get life on Mars, you certainly get it on Earth pretty quickly thereafter, and vice versa. So people often say, do I believe there li is or was life on Mars? And I always say, uh, well, I know there must have been life on Mars because we know Earth rocks go to Mars, and we know the conditions on Mars were like Earth when we know that there was life on Earth. So it must have happened that Earth life has been conveyed to Mars. And if there ever was Mars life, vice versa. So there are a coupled ecosystem, maybe only weakly coupled, but it's one and the same. Uh, so the dangers of a killer microbe you know, coming from, from Mars and a meteorite, I think, uh, greatly exaggerated, I think because there's been this traffic of material and potentially traffic of microbes throughout history, um, any concerns of that sort are gone. So if we go to Mars, I think we could set up shop there without any serious worry about us being wiped out by indigenous uh, biota. And so I'm a great proponent of the one-way ticket to Mars. I wrote this article in the New York Times in 2004. I think uh, we could go there, I think we should go there uh, uh, through a series of one-way missions. It's a slightly more respectable uh, paper on the, the subject written with Derek Schultz McCook. Uh, and we think, uh, along with a lot of other people, like this uh, Mars One conglomerate, uh, that one-way missions are the way to go about this. Um, why, why Mars? Um, because, as uh, Bob Subrin has often said, Mars is the second safest place in the solar system after Earth, so it's a good place to imagine uh, colonizing, uh, and we, I think we don't have to worry about uh, an alien biosphere because it's already intermingled. So we see these pictures of a Mars colony, maybe 2030, if uh, Bob's dreams come true or if the advocates of one-way missions come true, we could see this. And then over a period of time, quite a long period of time, it, it could become self-sustaining. We could imagine eventually uh, getting enough species diversity on Mars that it could, even if the Earth was wiped out, keep going. And then over a very long period of time, we can imagine terraforming it and turning it into a, another Earth. Um, so I want to leave on that optimi optimistic note. If there is any question time, um, I, uh, uh, I, I, I'm happy to talk about um, so, some ideas about uh, uh, propulsion, which, um, which have come up in the past. Uh, some of the novel propulsion mechanisms involving mining, so-called mining the quantum vacuum, are based on work that I did in the 1970s and, uh, and in my view, seriously misunderstand the nature of that work. So if there's an opportunity to talk about that in question time, I'd be happy to put the record straight. Yeah, uh, in a nutshell, you, you cannot mine the quantum vacuum and use it as a propulsion system. So I think I'll leave there because I have run out of time, but I'm happy to uh, take questions on this topic or anything else. Um, uh, absolutely fabulous, fabulous. Okay. But um, are you aware of Craig Venter's work sifting the ocean and then just smashing everything that he, he gets in a jar? Yes, and, yes, and yes, then yes. just he, sifting through it all and getting just not specific organisms, right. but a sense. And right. Do you I, think that that's an approach that may best sift at a very rapid way for your aliens. Yeah, no, and I've talked to them about this uh, because I'd like them, as it were, to keep an eye open when they're doing that sifting. The problem is that in order to take the genetic inventory of this sort of mishmash of stuff, uh, they're still having to use the assumption of the, the genetic, the, the known our genetic code uh, and, and other aspects of uh, terrestrial microbiology. In other words, you've got to uh, rather narrow down to a rather well-defined way, the nature of the thing you're looking for. And so I don't think they'd even pick up if there were, uh, everything was identical, but it was the mirror image, you know, with uh, right-handed amino acids and left-handed sugars. I think they wouldn't, uh, their techniques wouldn't work for that. So uh, well, they could be overlooking a huge amount of stuff. So but do you think they have to find the beast first? Well, I, I do have, a, no, in fact, I have other ideas, which we published in that paper and in, in subsequent papers about, uh, Basically, what you want to do is filter out all life as you know it. And if anything else grows, 
then by definition is life as we don't know it. The question is, what is that filter? Um, would, would take a while to explain that, but we certainly have ideas about that. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to uh, bring to your attention an aspect of, of, of this subject uh, that, that actually uh, is implicit in some of the points that you made, but you didn't seem to connect the dots. Um, which is uh, this, is that uh, the, the, the galaxy is almost certainly filled with life if from no other source than the Earth, okay? Because we've had life on this planet for at least 3.6 billion years, and throughout that time, we have been spewing bacteria off in every direction. Uh, and in, in particular, okay, the spewing occurs during uh, periods of bombardment which um, occur when other stars pass through our Oort cloud and, and spill them down. So, and, and we bombard them at the same time as well. So in other words, during these close encounters, and if you look at, uh, if, you, if you simply take stars and move them around randomly at like five kilometers a second and so forth, you get close encounters every 20 or 30 million years. Um, which interestingly is, is very close to the frequency of mass extinctions on Earth. Um, okay, you get these mutual bombardments and they occur when the stars are close to each other, okay, less than a light year. And the, the, uh, and the travel times of things that travel at interplanetary class velocities uh, to go a light year, light year is 60,000 AU, okay, uh, is, is tens of thousands of years and Bacteria, there are bacteria that can survive cosmic ray doses that they would encounter in space for that periods of time. So, you know, uh, there's a mystery in that we don't find uh, forms of life on Earth simpler than bacteria, which has led some people to suspect that life did not originate on Earth, but immigrated here. But whether it immigrated here or originated here, uh, we've been spreading it everywhere. And, um, and then once it spreads anywhere, it spreads from there everywhere, and, and you get a chain reaction. Uh, I have a paper on this, it was published in the JBIS around 10 years ago that goes through the math. But basically, there's a term missing from the Drake equation, which is he only narrows down the number of, 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 of stars to the numbers that have planets, the number that are in the habitable zone, and so forth. But he doesn't include the term for the number of planets it spread life to once it got there. And if you view this as a criticality problem, okay, like a critical nuclear reactor, where uh, you get a critical reactor if each neutron on average causes a fission that produces one other neutron. If the galaxy is a critical uh, reactor in which the average planet gets, that gets life spreads it to 1.0000 epsilon, et cetera, then you get uh, exponential proliferation of life. And, and I think that's almost certain. Right, so what you say is, uh, is completely correct. I've never been much of a fan of this so-called panspermia uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, in its original version, the microbes were wafting naked through interstellar space, and they would soon be killed by the radiation. Uh, inside rocks, of course, they're protected, but then the cross-section for colliding with another Earth-like planet goes down. And that, so it is just a numbers game, and you're perfectly right in your assessment of this. And the numbers I've been working off are those that Jay Melosh produced. Um, and the figure that sticks in my mind is that um, uh, the probability that during the history of the solar system, and a uh, rock knocked off Earth hits another Earth-like planet is 1 in 10,000. So uh, your numbers seem to be more optimistic. I take your point about the uh, favorable encounters because of the proximity at the very time the bombardment takes place. It would be foolish to say that the mechanism that you are describing had never occurred, because I mean, obviously it's possible. Uh, whether it has crossed that threshold of criticality so it becomes a really important factor in spreading life around, I don't know. I mean, I was always under the impression from talking to, to people like Melosh that, uh, that the answer was no. I suspect it's a, a, a field that we need more work to be done. And of course it changes every time we learn more about the numbers of planets and their distribution in the galaxy and so on. And what role, for example, rogue planets might, might play in this, because they could still 
be a place, a refuge for life and convey them to other parts of, of the galaxy. But generally, I've been, been a bit against it, in spite of the fact that Fred Hoyle, uh, of course, resurrected this pan spermia theory in the 1980s, and Fred gave me my first job, and so I always feel I should talk uh, re respectfully about his ideas, but I never really was very happy with that one. But, but you're talking about something different because it's there inside rocks, and that's important. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the, the case of the war between the wars, where the, uh, uh, the bacteria from the earth... Where, where are you? So I'm I am here, I am here. Where, yes. where the bacteria from the earth uh, was the reason the, the Martians were killed. Right. Well, duh, of course, they, they were eating the humans raw. If they will have been civili civilized, they will have cooked the humans. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, you, you mentioned also the, the issue of, of the multiple ab uh, abiogenesis uh, uh, events, and sometimes I hear that in the context uh, of the Fermi paradox, as, a, um, as and, and the argument goes like that, because we have only one abiogenesis event that we are aware on the Earth, the, the, the odds are against uh, the occurrence of life uh, ever elsewhere. And I think the looking into this shadow biosphere is a great question, but uh, I have a, an objection uh, on, the, on the idea that multiple abiogenesis are, are evidence of, of anything because uh, if you have life that is based on the same building blocks as, as, as us with the same amino, amino acids and then we are probably, uh, when, when the first event occurred, we supposed had the amin, an amino acids free and they uh, freely interacted and the random combinations were tried. But if we already have a, 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 bio, a, a biosphere, probably those amino acids are not free and enough to, to generate the enough permutations to generate, to, uh, to raise the odds of a, a second abiogenetic event. So uh, if, the, if we have a separate we, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, can you, uh, right. Well, I'm not yeah. sure that you ask, yeah. ask the question, so I'll, I know. I'll we, pass on that. I think I'll institute a rule. If you get the mic and you don't ask a question, that's the end of the questions. <laughs> now, that's a cruel rule, I know. But uh, we, we just, you know, questions are actually more interesting than speeches. Right. So, we, yes, thank you. Have we done? Uh, Jim, do you have something? Oh, you, you gave an example of, uh, a life form moving in on another's uh, territory and existing at a different temperature. Now, life tends to spread out and fill all the ecosystem it can, and life on Earth here exists at temperatures above boiling, below freezing, and right. huge range. But there's still how a limit. Like, how likely is it be, it, will it be that a developed ecosystem will not have filled all the niches? Well, we haven't filled all of, of ours here on Earth. And, and uh, so in these deep ocean volcanic uh, vents, the temperature spewing out of the vents is about 300 degrees. And so um, a, a big, just for simple biochemical reasons, uh, life as we know it can't survive at like 200 degrees, but it had different biochemistry in mind. And then there are, we, we had a list in this paper of about half a dozen uh, parameters you could look at. High UV flux, for example. Um, life as we know it struggles in the upper atmosphere on tops of mountains, but you could imagine a different biochemistry would cope with that very high pH, low pH, salinity, and so on. There's a, there's a parameter space, um, and uh, it would be rash to say that we filled all of that parameter space here on Earth, so there, there will still be gaps. Thank you.